Hi everyone, my name is Mark Vetter. I'm one of the Clinical Anatomy Fellows here at the Seattle Science Foundation. And I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on with um, Dr. Iwanaga, a project that's hopefully going to um, turn into two separate papers. And this project kind of revolves around the deep cervical artery, which is a small branch in, uh, in the posterior neck, and the relationship of the deep cervical artery with um, different structures, um, specifically the nutrient foramina of the axis, um, which is relevant for C2 pedicle screw placement, and also the relationship of the deep cervical artery with the vertebral artery, um, uh, with the purpose of seeing if the deep cervical artery could be used for a vertebral artery bypass. Cool. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the purpose of the two parts of this study. Um, the first part, um, which revolves around the nutrient foramina, as I described earlier, um, the purpose is to measure the diameter of the deep cervical artery at multiple points and its location relative to the nutrient foramen of the axis. This is important because nutrient foramina um, have been described as a useful anatomical target for the placement of C2 pedicle screws. So for certain surgeons, um, because C2 pedicle screw placement can be a very delicate procedure, um, having sort of an anatomical marker that you can use for screw insertion would be very useful. Um, and the nutrient foramina is one. Um, eligible are eligible candidates for that. The second part of the study focused around assessing the feasibility of using the deep cervical artery for an autogenous graft in vertebral artery um, bypasses. So we're going to talk about both. Um, we'll start with the first part of the study and then move on to the second part. So to start off, um, I want to give you guys a little bit of background information about um, C2 pedicle screw placement or transpedicular screw fixation. Um, as I mentioned, the reason that the nutrient foramina are important is um, because they may be useful for this kind of fixation, um, and thus the deep cervical artery as it relates to nutrient foramina may be important. So posterior fixation of C2 with pedicle screws is still commonly used to treat atlantioaxial instability, which has multiple etiologies, um, but specifically um, it's still transpedicular screw fixation is very commonly used to deal um, with Effendi fractures which are fractures um, in which um, the pedicles um, bilaterally on C2 are fractured superiorly to inferiorly. Um, Fendi fractures are also commonly known as hangman fractures, have been historically. Um, and posterior fixation using pedicle screws is commonly used in types 2 and 3 uh, of these kind of fractures, which um, are usually known the unstable um, fracture variants of Fendi fractures. Um, and so here you can see I've just kind of placed some images that um, describe what C2 pedicle screw placement looks like from different um, planes. And I just wanted to also use this time to kind of use the entry points as shown uh, in this part of the image as a marker for you guys of where the nutrient foramen are usually located on C2. They kind of vary a little bit, but they usually are around the entry points on this image. And so as I mentioned before, C2 pedicle screw placement is a pretty ris uh, risky procedure because as you can see on either side you have the vertebral artery which passes um, very closely to the, um, to the pedicles so there's not a lot of wiggle room there um, which is why having an entry point um, as an anatomical landmark would be important. And so there are um, already studies out there that kind of talk about the number of foramina present um, bilaterally on C2 um, and also the diameter of these nutrient foramina. So we're focusing more on the relationship of the deep cervical artery to the nutrient foramina rather than the foramina themselves. Awesome. So talking about the deep cervical artery, I'm just going to give you guys a brief anatomical overview. So the deep cervical artery is a small branch of the costocervical trunk. Oops. Yeah. Costocervical trunk right here. Um, which is itself a branch of the subclavian artery, which Dr. Patel was just talking about. And so um, the deep cervical um, runs superiorly, um, usually from around the origin of the first rib, and it runs deep to the splenius capitis muscle, but superficial to the semispinalis capitis. So it runs in between those two muscles. And as it arises, um, it usually gives off branches to different um, cervical vertebrae, usually up to the C2 level. We're focusing on the C2 level on nutrient foramina, but it also gives off um, branches to the nutrient foramina of other cervical vertebrae. Cool. Uh, so that's it on the anatomy of the deep cervical artery. Let's talk a little bit about the study itself and our results. So 
As you can see here for reference, this is a dissection of the posterior neck. Um, left is lateral in this case, and right here is the midline, so medial. So this is the left side of the posterior neck. A um, couple important structures to keep in mind. This muscle right here is the uh, semispinalis capitis, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, surfaces, sorry. Yeah. And this is um, the vertebral artery, so as it moves laterally to medially. Um, here I've put in a couple circles here to show you the different points at which we are measuring the diameter of the deep cervical artery. They also show up on this um, cool little uh, drawing that we made. Um, so we kind of numbered these as diameter 1, diameter 2, and diameter 3. We also measured the distance from the midline to the point at which the deep cervical artery enters the nutrient foramen of C2. Here you can see C2, this is the lamina of C2, um, and this is the nutrient foramina right here. And so um, we have our initial results. We're still adding specimens to the study, but for now um, we have the diameter at 0.1 here where it enters the nutrient foramen of the deep cervical artery at around half a millimeter, um, just superficially uh, and, I mean, superiorly and um, inferiorly to the distal branching point. Um, we have a diameter of 0.8 millimeters and 1.7 millimeters respectively. And finally, um, we also been measuring the distance from the midline to the entry point, and we've come up so far with approximately 27 millimeters as the distance between those two points. So as I said earlier, we're adding more samples, uh, specimens, so these numbers are subject to change. Cool, so let's talk a little bit about the second part of the study, which um, was uh, assessing the feasibility of using the deep cervical artery in a vertebral artery bypass. So as we all know, Vertebral artery aneurysms can lead to a wide variety of complications, which include hemiparesis, coma, and, and death. Um, and so amongst other forms of treatment, microsurgical revascularization via bypass and occlusion of the bypass section of the artery is a common form of treatment um, for, the, for vertebral artery aneurysms. And um, thinking about using the deep cervical artery um, to bypass the vertebral artery is kind of outside of the box, if you will. More commonly, um, you'll see in autogenous vert, uh, vertebral artery bypasses the radial artery or the saphenous vein being used. So this is kind of a new um, way to approach vertebral artery bypasses. Um, however, the proximity of the deep cervical artery would make it a very attractive option to use for a vertebral artery bypass. So that's why we're asking ourselves the question. Um, and specifically, so. Um, we're measuring the feasibility of artificially anastomosing the DCA to the V3 segment of the um, vertebral artery, so the segment that travels um, laterally to medially before um, the vertebral artery enters the dura. So these are some initial results. Here again is an image from a dissection in the lab. Um, same left side of the posterior neck. And here again, I'll point out some of the important structures. Mentioned earlier, this is the vertebral artery running from lateral to medial. Um, here we have the deep cervical artery. Um, and I will mention, in order to anastomose the deep cervical artery with the vertebral artery, not only do you have to detach um, the distal branch as it enters the C2 nutrient foramen, you also have to detach the branches that go to the nutrient foramen of all proximal um, cervical levels um, in order to get enough um, of the artery to pull up an anastomose. So here you see the deep cervical artery, and here at this blue circle, which I outlined, you have the point at which um, the artery connects or is grafted with the vertebral artery. Um, so it seems like this can be done without putting too much mechanical stress on um, the deep cervical artery. However, we need more information before we can um, categorically state that this is an option. First of all, um, according to our estimates, um, in order for the blood flow through the deep cervical artery to be um, adequate enough to use it as a vertebral artery bypass, the diameter of the deep cervical artery as it enters into the C2 nutrient foramina would probably need to be at least half a millimeter wide because the vertebral artery, according to literature, usually has blood flow which exceeds 50 milliliters a minute, and so the deep cervical artery would have to be large enough to um, sustain a fraction of that that is acceptable. So. More studies needed um, on that front, and there's not a lot of extant medical literature um, on the deep cervical artery. Um, so, yeah, so more studies necessary. So, kind of just wrapping up and giving you guys some of the conclusions from the two parts of our study. 
Um, we measure the relative position of the deep cervical artery to the midline and the nutrient foramen of the axis. And these are important considerations for surgeons for a couple different reasons. First of all is it would help surgeons to potentially use the deep cervical artery as a landmark for, um, to find the nutrient foramen if they do choose to use the nutrient foramen as an anatomical landmark for C2 pedicle screw placement. Secondly, um, just in general, it may help in avoiding undue vascular damage during surgery. So knowing the diameter at multiple points of the deep cervical artery as well as its distance from the midline would um, better help surgeons to locate this um, vascular structure intraoperatively. And so for the second part of the study, um, our initial conclusions do indicate that the deep cervical artery may be um, feasibly used in a vertebral artery bypass, but we need more information on the deep cervical artery, specifically regarding um, blood flow. Um, yeah, so those are some of the um, conclusions of these studies which are still in progress. So here are my references, and thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, yeah, let me know.